Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Max. And this is Movie Nostalgia, where we give you an honest review of the movies we've meddled with so mischievously over on Maybe Movies. And on this episode, we are looking at Event Horizon. This is the 1996 sci-fi horror film directed by, uh, on this is credited as Paul Anderson, but you may know him better as Paul W.S. Anderson, starring Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Jolie Richardson, uh, Sean Pertwee, Jason Isaacs, Catherine Quinlan, uh, Robert, uh, Richard, excuse me, T. Jones, and I've forgotten the other guy's name. It's something noseworthy. Jason? No. no. Something noseworthy. Who's was um, uh, Baby Bear. Uh-huh. I'm yeah. sure I thought you were talking about I can't remember. I'm sure somebody in the room will correct me. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, as I said, it came out in 1996. And this is one of those ones, unfortunately, very much uh, was a flop. Uh, made on a budget of 60 million and only took 42 at the box office. Oof. Yeah. The <laughs> making of on, on this particular copy is actually really good. It's actually longer than the film. <laughs> Oh, bloody hell. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that a lot of the interviews in there with the director, he does say that he was inspired by the likes of uh, Kubrick's The Shining, <laughs> <laughs> The Haunting. His hand was unholy. Again, okay. all films that didn't do well at the box office. Now, I don't know whether that's just cope on, on, on his part. Obviously, having made that so much after the time, after the film was released. but Yeah, but, yeah, but they're also classics mm. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but I see what you mean it, yeah. Uh, yeah may have taken a little bit of the wrong inspiration from those movies <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but this one uh, I'm trying to think Obviously, I never saw it at the cinema I didn't see it when it came out I saw it I believe this is another one of the long contingent of films that when I was living in, in Sussex I used to go to the video store and they'd normally have offers on mm. like three for 20 quid or whatever yeah and this was one of the ones i was like oh i'd heard good things about it and picked it up blind buy if you like all right uh, let's see what this gives and it does give that, that there is one thing you can say about it <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i saw this as a cinema i think this was a video watch but it would have been when it first came out so it would have been late 96 or early 97 i think mm -hmm. what did i go and see at the cinema you know, I think we might have done. Okay. Yeah. I do have memories of seeing it on a big screen. But it was um, it, um instantly enjoyable. Oh, yeah. Instantly enjoyable. Absolutely. It's not... Certainly when you obviously, when you look at the box and things like that, you just go, oh, okay, you know, it's another, it's, it's another sci-fi film. And, and But it, as I said at the start, though, it, is, it does very much fall into that category of sci-fi horror. Yeah. I mean, I it's... Right up there. It's a lovely mixture of sci-fi and horror, like Alien. It's kind of, it's almost like the 90s answer to Alien, isn't it? Really? It is in a lot of ways. I mean, well, it's like Alien with a touch of Hellraiser. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My understanding of um, how they themselves kind of changed the original concept. Uh, the studio had, had received the, the script. They gave it to Paul Anderson because they'd liked to his first two films, Shopping, and then the second movie, which was the 90s Mortal Kombat. Okay, neither of which I have seen. Uh, the Shopping I haven't seen. Yes, I have seen the 90s Mortal Kombat. I can't really remember a lot about it. But apparently it did good, it did good business in America, so they thought it was a safe pair of hands. But they did, some, they did make some changes. I think premise much more involved uh, extraterrestrials in the original script. Oh, right, so it would have been much more alien meets yes, Hellraiser. Yeah. Oh, right, that's interesting. Uh, and then they made... The adjustments that they made. You see, I might, I might have enjoyed watching that film. That that doesn't sound too crazy to me at all. No, but again, it's interesting that you mentioned Hellraiser because the design of the gravity drive mm -hmm. in the original script was supposed to be just this big black bull. Oh right. But he added those elements into it as a homage to Hellraiser. Right. Yeah, the patterns and the spiking and everything yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll tear your soul apart. I mean, I know from some of the behind-the-scenes bits that I've seen that they deliberately designed the ship to look somewhat like a cathedral. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, which is very, very obvious there. But I don't know if you noticed. I, I, I actually noticed it this time watching for tonight. Like in the medical bay, if you look at it as a whole scene, it doesn't look like a medical bay. It looks like an old Victorian basement morgue. Yes, it does. It's even got tiled columns. Mm-hmm. But it's metal tiling instead of ceramic tiling. Yeah. But if you if you replaced all of the metal with ceramics, it would have looked almost exactly like an old Victorian morgue. Yeah, there is definitely that that um, gothic element of the ship. Mm. Look, the walkway, the connecting corridor, mm-hmm. is supposed to be um, a representation of the aisle in the cathedral. Ah, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And even like the drive section at the back, where the engines are on either side. Mm-hmm. Effectively, what they did, they modelled that on Notre Dame Cathedral. You, just, you take the front pillars from Notre Dame, turn them on their side, that's the drive section. Yeah, of course, yeah. You know, things like that. So, there, a lot of work went into this. You, you can't you can't take that away from them at all. So much beautiful production design. I mean, especially considering this was a time when people were throwing unnecessary CGI into films left, right and centre. Yeah. And they only CGI'd what they absolutely had to, like the anti-gravity moments and things like that. The stuff with the liquids... Yes, in zero G and things like that. Yeah, they absolutely. had to CGI that. Everything else, though, is physical. Well, except some of the explosions as well. Some of the explosions. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the yeah, the engine room they built that they had the um, they had the bomb set at um, Par- at um, Pinewood. Okay. So right. they built that entire thing, which is just incredible. But again, even coming back to what we were talking about last time, or the last one we were looking at, again that connecting corridor, it's reminiscent of the Cygnus. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of similarities when you watch those back to back. Which is kind of nice again if you know anything about obviously if you do, if you love movies, those little homages and things like that are are, are, are really nice. Is it your, did you do it last time? You know, yeah, I did it last time. It's your turn to do a, a brief synopsis of, of of the film. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, All right. So this is a film that features basically the crew of the Lewis and Clark, which is a search and rescue vehicle in 2047, Mm -hmm. a future in which we have slowly started to colonize the solar system. The crew are sent out on a mission, uh, find out what happened to and retrieve the Event Horizon, a ship that went missing seven years previously. When they arrive, things are definitely more than they seem and stuff shenanigans and things ensue we're leaving yes absolutely yeah and i must admit yeah it it really it was a bit of a gem and it was a bit of a find when i first watched it Mm. i really really loved it it's an unappreciated classic even it was at the in the time and i still feel like it is today it gets a little bit of love but not nearly as much as it should no and again especially coming from a director who Pretty much everything else that he's done, I really have no interest in. This is, I was going to say, this is this is the same guy that did the Resident Evil movies. It's the same guy that did the Resident Evil movies. It's the same guy that did... I mean, because it's so completely different from that stylization. Ah, uh, there's another one that he did that I was looking at that's now, of course, has just disappeared out of my memory. I'm sure somebody will fill in the blanks for me, but he did something else. What, recently? AVP. Oh, right. The first mm, AVP? Yeah. Yeah. So, again, he's not somebody... I mean, when you hear him and talking, he sounds like he seems like a really nice guy. He's an English guy, because, again, major, the majority of this production was a British production. Even though Oh, had, that explains some of the sensibilities that went into it. Okay, yeah. yeah. You know, they had a few people from, from the, the, the studio said that they managed to get... I can't remember the guy's name, but one of the principal um, special effects supervisors is a guy who worked on, oddly enough, things like Silent Running... Uh, two, oh. 2001. Okay. Oh, nice. So he still had a, quite a pedigree in terms of doing the sci-fi. The, uh, yeah, the I was going to say one of the old, old school guys. Yeah. Yeah, but the majority of the production team and, and obviously the cast were all British. Most of the cast, obviously, they were got the British oh, um, of course, yes. techno group um, Orbital working with Michael Kamen on the score. <laughs> Yeah, there's some really great work going on here. And it's so different stylistically from the rest of his work. So if you're put off by his more recent films, like The Resident Evils and things like that, this is not like that. It doesn't have that sensibility. This is an earlier period in his career before he developed this weird style that he has in so many of his films. It's also a good one to watch as well because of the, um, you know, like so many of these films. The film as it stands at the minute is about an hour and 36. The original cut of the film was just over two hours. Mm, I'd love to see that cut. Test audiences and the studio said it was too much. They wanted him to cut out uh, half an hour from the film because they were still filming stuff. Because he was shooting, he was he did direct. He directed the first unit and the second unit as well. Oh right, I see. So they had a cut that was in excess of two hours, and they hadn't finished filming. Mm. 
oh, that that's different. Well, two, well, I, I mean, a twenty, I, an extra 15, 20 minutes to this film, I think, would be good. Yeah. There's some stuff that could do with filling in. Well, most of the second unit stuff was the... The 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 stuff that puts the film on the map. Let's put it that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so he was still shooting some of that bit, some of those bits. Yeah. And so he had literally like six weeks to get a cut to them because he was still shooting for another two weeks after they finished principal photography. He only had four weeks to get the cut to them. Okay. So that's what he submitted. That's what the test audiences saw and what the studio saw, which they didn't like. Right. So he had to go away, and even now, apparently, he says that he thinks they cut out about ten minutes more than he wanted to. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean there's anything wrong with the film. Don't get me wrong, folks. That's not what I'm saying. But there are certain dynamics, the character developments that could have had a, an extra to... two or three minutes per person, and you would have had something more complete. Absolutely. Just enough. And I would have loved to see more of that second fo- unit footage of yeah. the... Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you you only get little tiny flashes, and it's like if they'd gone a little further, it would have been on a par with Hellraiser in terms of its impact. Absolutely, absolutely, and it is a shame because there's little setups that just need a bit longer to breathe, mm-hmm. just yeah. to, to add that extra element of the gothic into there. Yeah, that's what it needed, and it would have, and you would have definitely had a masterpiece. I mean, it still is; it's still a fantastic film, but yeah. Apparently in 2012, two of the producers said that they'd found Mm -hmm. a copy of the original cut. Mm -hmm. But that's all that's happened. I think somebody again in 2017 said, actually the quality isn't good enough for them to reconstruct from. That's what I'd heard, that the quality was just too low. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's kind of gone quiet since then. But if it is is out there, that would be... Yeah, I'd love to see it. I would love to see that cut. Definitely, definitely. But for you uh, you folks at home, don't worry about that at all. This is a 95-minute movie that moves along at a brisk pace. It never settles for too long while still giving you enough information to keep you completely up to date on what's going on in the movie. Absolutely. And again, brilliant performances all round. Fantastic another performance from, from Sean Pertwee. Mm. When they cast him, because he had worked with Paul Anderson on his previous two films. Mm-hmm. He turned up with this idea for his character and he'd bleached his hair blonde. That's why he shaved. That's why he shaved. (laughs) Right, okay. Because they were like, uh, mm, not sure. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds about right. This is actually before I took notice of him. Mm. Both him and Jason Isaacs in this film. I'd watched the film, but I didn't notice them. Jason Isaacs, I didn't notice until Harry Potter and Mm. Sean. Not much long after this, I didn't notice until Dog Soldiers. Oh, that was the one that put him on the map for me. Yes. And there's old Nick, shortening his fucking arsehole off at us. Yeah. So, of course, watching this back now, is like, oh, yeah, I didn't realise how famous these people were going to be. Yeah. Yeah. It does, I must admit, watching this, it does make me interested in watching Shopping. I don't know that much about it. I remember it, I remember hearing about it when it came out, but I don't really know it. All right. Obviously, it was his first film. But it's something to do with... I think there was a spate of it at the time in the early 90s about ram raiding. Mm-hmm. It's to do with that. Oh. That's about all I know. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, not the sort of thing that, that that would normally be my cup of tea. This sort of thing is my bag, baby. But uh, I suppose I could give it a look sometimes to see what it's like. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But this one, uh, I don't know about you. It's oh, yeah, two thumbs up. All of them. Both of them, yeah. take them and enjoy them. And yeah, definitely if you are a fan of sci-fi, if you're looking for something a bit different, if you're a fan of horror and looking for something a bit different, watch this. It's it's fantastic. Uh, again, brilliant performances all around from a, from a stellar cast. Uh, yes, absolutely worth your time and worth a rewatch on multiple levels. Yes. I thought we might take, um, take in some art. Oh. I've got some very special piece of art that we should go and have a look at. And I thought maybe we should go and see Egale's Wall. <laughs> and I've even brought snacks. It's a special little snack to take away from the Soylent Company. So you can choose <laughs> from that <laughs> whichever you, you wish to uh, in, engage with next. But as always, until next time, you take care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you soon. As always, guys, TTFN. Boom, boom.